I'm Michelle Marinkovic, the Associate Vice Provost for Undergraduate Education and the Director of the Center for Teaching and Learning. And I want to thank you so much for coming today to the 112th talk in CTL's award-winning Teachers on Teaching. And I mention that number because I think it is a lovely reflection on the seriousness with which teaching is taken at Stanford that at this point in the series, we are still able to recruit speakers of the stature and passion and interest of Professor Vakil. And I'm also delighted to see another one of our former speakers, Eric Roberts, Professor Eric Roberts of the CS department here. Um, so uh, Robbie will be talking to us about guiding students as they learn how to think which is something that all of us care about in terms of our impact on students, whether we're teaching writing or speaking or psychology or mathematics, most of us hope that one of the things we do for students is to teach them to think for themselves and to think at the highest levels. And as a mathematician, a puzzle solver, a member of the Seuss Committee, the instructor last quarter of a new course called Education as Self-Fashioning, Rigorous and Precise Thinking, as the host for many years of a math competition and the co-founder of a journal called Mathematical Mayhem, Robbie is particularly well equipped to speak on the topic of better thinking. A graduate of the University of Toronto, where he was a four-time winner of the American Mathematical Association's uh, Putnam Award, he received his PhD in mathematics at Harvard in 1997 and taught at Princeton and MIT before Stanford was lucky enough to get him in 2001. He combines research in algebraic geometry at the highest levels with an uncanny ability to stir interest in mathematics and to form excited communities of the math inspired, whether they are high school students in math circles or Stanford students aiming for elite math competitions. To be around Ravi is to fall prey, and this is a case where none of us needs to fear becoming the prey, to the joy and wonder of mathematics. As you can imagine, all kinds of awards, research and teaching have resulted, and I can only mention a few so that Ravi himself will have time to speak. His research has been recognized by the American Mathematical Society Centennial Fellowship, the Frederick E. Terman Fellowship here at Stanford, the Alfred P. Sloan Research Fellowship, the NSF Career Grant, the Presidential Early Career Award for Scientists and Engineers, the Coxeter James Prize from the Canadian Mathematical Society, and the Andre Eisenstadt Prize from the Centre de Recherche Mathematique in Montreal. And for graduate students and postdocs, this would be a dream resume, so pay attention. <laughs> For his instructional achievements, he's been recognized by the School of Humanities and Sciences Dean's Award for Distinguished Teaching and by the Bass University Fellowship. Because Robbie is not only a professor of mathematics, he's also the Robert C. Packard University Fellow. In a similar vein, he is also currently the American Mathematical Association's um, Polia lecturer, an appointment designed to encourage the same, quote, high quality exposition, unquote, of mathematics as George Polia, author of How to Solve It and an outstanding math professor for several decades right here at Stanford. We are particularly fortunate that Ravi agreed to speak this quarter because technically he's on sabbatical spending part of his time at the American Institute of Mathematics. And in addition to listening to Ravi's upcoming lecture, I urge you to visit his homepage in math, since it goes far beyond a history of his academic achievements to invite you into sharper thinking on mathematics and on education. I give you Professor Ravi Vakil. Thank you. 
so thank you very much. Uh, thank you very much, Michelle, for uh, for uh, the very kind introduction. Is, is the sound okay? I, no, it's not okay. What's that? Don't touch it. Okay. Here we go. Let's see how this works. Great. So, uh, so I, I, wa I want to say first of all that I very much and have enjoyed seeing previous uh, versions of this lecture often online because the, uh, the, the timing is often hard to make, but happily many, many of the lectures are available. Uh, so, uh, so, and so uh, the question I really have is what I can tell you that's of value to you. And to be honest, I'm not, I have some ideas I'm not completely sure. So I have some things I'd like to say, but I'd, I'd, I'd like to, uh, I hope you stop me and ask questions and, and uh, let me know what you most want to hear about. So, um, uh, so I'm going to speak as a mathematician, and I think uh, because that's where my experience is, of course. And also, I think being a mathematician has given me the chance to see some things that other people may not have seen, and I'll tell you a little bit about that. But I want to first get an idea of, of who's here. Which can I ask? How many people? I'm going to see where in the intellectual geography of the university, uh, whether you see your, whether you're, uh, you self-identify as engineers, scientists, uh, social scientists, or humanists. Uh, and hopefully you'll be near one of those four. So how many people here self-identify as on the engineering side of things? Okay, then science, and then social science, and then humanities. Okay, so that's a reasonable. Uh, so, 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 it's a, so, it's a, so it's a reasonable mix. Okay, uh, uh, and also one thing I'd like to do, which may be a bit unusual, is this is being recorded. But I've asked for the last ten minutes not to be recorded, so we could talk off the record, since there's some things it's easier to say when they're not. Uh, when they're not recorded for posterity. So, uh, so I'll save that for the end. So, uh, so let me start by uh, telling you some of the aspects of things, uh, of, of, of things I've seen where I want to try to give you some, uh, some ideas, uh, both general vague things and precise tools that I've used. Uh, first, uh, at some point I want to tell you about mathematic math circles, which is something which students age roughly 10 or even younger all the way up through distinguished faculty members in Eastern Europe uh, 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 have done for many decades and that are now introduced in the US. Also, I guess as a mathematician, I'm used to dealing with very large numbers of students. So, so dealing with large volume in a small amount of time requires some techniques. Uh, I want to mention this problem solving seminar that I began in 2001 uh, and ran until 2007 and that my colleague, uh, Sandra Rajan, who's a fantastic, uh, a fantastic teacher is now running. Uh, if there's time, uh, uh, there's some quicker inspired experiments in more advanced courses. And I know this will apply perhaps more to the scientists, but I know Lanier Anderson in philosophy has been experimenting with these ideas in, in, in courses outside of science and engineering as well. Um, also, I had the great pleasure, it's rare to say this about a, an academic committee, but I had the great pleasure of being part of a committee, uh, of, of the SUS committee, and in particular I feel as though I, I had a particular perspective coming at it from, from mathematics. And last, uh, but not least, I want to discuss uh, some ideas that came to me while preparing and, and, and being involved with this course called Education in Self-Fashioning, uh, Rigorous and Precise Thinking. Okay, but before, before, I, uh, before I get to that, I feel uh, obliged to, to talk about some other general things too, which I, some of which are, I, I want to say some things that you've heard many times that's obvious, but I do want to at least briefly discuss something that's hard to talk about sometimes, which is the tension research, between research and teaching. I, I, and, and then I want to talk about essentially framing how you think about teaching and uh, about, about your students as well. So, so, so let me start there. So uh, the thing I, I I'm most wanted to say here in a public venue is, is this issue of, of, of the tension between research and teaching. Um, I think in public we say one thing. Uh, as a university, that, that, that teaching and research, there's no conflict, they go together hand in hand. We are a fantastic teaching university, we're a fantastic research university. In private, there are discussions that I find somewhat problematic where there's a sense of conflict between the two, where there's often it's described as teaching, uh, as research versus, versus teaching, as teaching taking up va valuable resources at, at, uh, at a research university. So I, I, I want to say things tactfully, not step on anyone's toes, but I, I, but I intend this partially as advice for, uh, for well, I remember when I arrived as an assistant professor and uh, when I was doing my PhD, um, uh, the, the difference between the public and private discussions I found, uh, I didn't know who to believe. Uh, and I want to at least put a, and, and I, I at least want to put a, a case forward, which is maybe not the, tip, which is, uh, uh, well, which I, of course I think is the right case. So let me, uh, so, so let me first acknowledge that 
that for, for, that for people in this room who are trying to balance their teaching with many other important things that you're doing, which I rather suspect will be absolutely everyone in this room, it's a challenge. And, uh, and this is something which should somehow be, uh, somehow be acknowledged. But I don't see research in inherent conflict with teaching in the following sense, which is that uh, it is true that the way that what's recognized sometimes um, teaching can, in some departments can be seen as, as positive, other departments negative, and others as, as somehow neutral. Uh, but there's a way in which teaching is, is uh, not on an equal footing with research because it's really apples and oranges. Uh, so I, I want to get to this uh, when I talk about edu the education and self-fashioning experiment. But the reason teaching is important to me is because I'm a researcher. It's not, in, it's not a separate mission. I, if you believe what you're doing is incredibly important, if what you do is, is extremely interesting, then you feel compelled to share it. And this is not something in competition. It's not on the same footing. It's a completely different beast altogether. But if what you're doing is important, then you don't want to hide it under a bushel. It's something you want to, uh, that, that, that you should feel compelled to share. And I want to mention, I won't mention him, uh, mention the person by name, but I remember we were trying to hire uh, a, a younger colleague of mine in my department. And we were at a bar in downtown Palo Alto late at night. This is before I had kids, so I could do such things. Um, uh, and he asked a question which, uh, uh, which taught me a lot about him in a good way, which is he asked, he said, you know, how serious is Stanford about teaching publicly? Publicly, we, uh, I, I'm, he was being courted by a number of universities, all of which said the same things. Uh, and, and, I, and some peer institutions would say privately, well, okay, publicly we say this, but don't worry about this. We'll protect you from the teaching aspect of, of the career. And, and so he asked me, well, is Stanford similar? And I was able to say, at risk of losing a future colleague, well, actually, here we have fantastic undergraduates and graduate students. And it's a privilege to be able to somehow shape the future of the field by interacting with them. So frankly, this is a place where it actually does matter. It's a key part of what we do as a research university, not in competition with being a research university. And he, and, and I was, I didn't know what he would say, but he actually was very happy to hear this. And now he's a colleague here and not elsewhere. And I feel as though this is actually, this actually helps us as a research university, does not actually hurt us. And the point I want to get to at the end, I want to conclude with, is really, I believe, the best place for the best students to get the best education is at the best research university. So this is not, this should not be seen. It's quite, uh, very much not in conflict. But I'll, I'll wait until the end before, before I get to that. But first, let me say some, some obvious stuff that you've, that you've um, so I, I have noticed that people say the same things over and over again at these lectures. And I always love it when I hear them. And I feel as though I want to add my voice to the chorus because there are very few things that I've, I've done that everyone seems to want to try, and that really work. Uh, so so I, want to at least, I want to at least get those out of the way and say them too. First is that I love the fact that CTL is called the Center for Teaching and Learning. Not, it's not just teaching, because really what we're doing, m most of the learning we did growing up and today uh, was outside of the classroom. The classroom set us up to, for a lot of learning, but the learning happened outside of the classroom. And what we're doing in the classroom is setting up learning, some of which happens inside the classroom. So, so the learning aspect, the fact that the way in which I frame what we do with our students is being about learning, not about teaching. It's about what they're doing, not about what I'm doing. Uh, really changed at some point uh, when I, I realized this changed the way in which I approached the classroom. Uh, maybe the most important thing in any lecture is know your audience. And I want to mention a couple of ways in which this is true. Uh, a, a couple of ways in which the, this can be done. Uh, again, a very standard thing, but again, a minority of our colleagues do this. If you know your students' names, it makes a big difference. It's hard, to, it's hard to feel emotionally invested in someone if you don't know their name, if they're a faceless crowd. Uh, so knowing their names in advance, and I have, a, I have a, a colleague, another great teacher in my department, who's doing, this for the, who's, te who's doing this for the first time this quarter. And the great thing about learning everyone's name, um, or, or lots of people's names, uh, is, that it, is, that, is that it doesn't take that much. Uh, you don't have to have a good memory. It doesn't take that much time. Uh, uh, and uh, it, uh, and it just changes the entire classroom. And the thing to be clear, I should have said with the, uh, maybe let me go back to the conflict between research and teaching. Time and attention is a valuable resource. And when you spend time on teaching, you are potentially saving time as well. So learning people's names is an investment at the front of the course where you do spend more time than your colleagues do. But you spend less time later on because, uh, uh, because you've already made a connection with the students. Uh, and then they know you, and you can, and they will give you so much more. You can demand so much more of them 
uh, if you know them personally. You can, uh, so, uh, and so a way in which I do this, uh, again, this is standard. I just want to mention a couple of tweaks which I found useful, is I have them fill out often index cards with information about themselves. And for me, what matters, and, and what me, different subjects will have different things which matter for them, uh, I have their name, um, where they're from, especially if they're freshmen, uh, what their academic interests in are, what their non-academic interests are. Uh, but I also have them draw a sketch of themselves. And this is something which, um, to be really, you know, we have their pictures. This, uh, this, uh, you know, we, we have their pictures on access. So why do we do this? In some sense, it's, it's, uh, it, it kind of it breaks the ice. Uh, they, uh, you also get a sense of their personality when you find out what they're. They think what matters often is is their academic interests. I am interested in that, but I can already guess that it's their non-academic interests and, and that actually are kind of interesting. And then it lets me remember who they are. If I remember someone has a well, they can be get, they can get very strange. Uh, and if someone has something very strange about themselves, then then all, it makes it much easier to remember 100 or 150 names uh, if if they're not just random names. Uh, so uh, so 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 small personalized things seem seem like something which is really useful. Also, meeting your students. This is something which is a, a, a major time investment and does pay off, but, um, but it, uh, it, it's, it's hard to do. I find I can do this once I'm up to around 120 students, and then, it start, then, then the time begins to become harder. So, so, so what, I, what I'd like to do, with, especially with freshmen, and ideally first quarter freshmen, is, is, to, is to have them come by my office. They sign up. And there are a couple of things that, that publicly it's about one thing and secretly it's about something else. So they sign up for a 10 or 15 minute slot and they are back to back. So I, so I, suffer, uh, uh, so I suffer in terms of getting mentally tired uh, when you have a large number of people coming to your office uh, in, in large chunks of time. But they, they come and they meet you and you have conversations beginning with the card and you can, you can ask them questions related to the course. But that's only to get the discussion going. And then someone else comes in and interrupts you and then joins the discussion. And people go in and out. And somehow what you're doing is building a conversation. Uh, you get to know them as people. You get them to meet each other as people. So people they know, they're no longer uh, in a class with a bunch of strangers. They at least have someone, uh, some people who they know. The conversations go interesting places, sometimes uh, surprisingly often, often valuable places. One really important thing for me is that people, you want people to come to your office hours. This is good value for time for you. You want, you know, in the same way that when you, when you give a lecture, you want interaction with, with, with the audience. If you're giving a course, you want people to come by your office hours. And the first obstruction to have people coming is they don't know where your office is. It takes just a little bit of time to find out where your office is, but that makes all the difference. And so if you can instead have them come early, they know where it is, they, they don't have to think. They know you're friendly, they know other people will be there. Um, so, that, so, so, um, so that's made a big difference. And I've noticed when I've actually, I've empirically tested some quarters I've done this, others I've not. And it really affected the dynamics both in the classroom and the number of people who actually came to office hours. Um, another thing about, uh, another thing I think I learned um, through bitter experience uh, is uh, when, in trying to become a better teacher, um, I think there's an idea that there's, there's one way to become a good teacher. Not so much in this community, which knows this well, uh, but when you're just starting out, you think this is what this is. I should be of this form, and you cannot be someone you're not. You, uh, different people have different personalities, and somehow playing to your personality can help. One thing I tried early on, and I still struggle with, is when I when I give a lecture, uh, when I give a talk, I get excited. When I get excited, I start start to speak more quickly. If I'm talking in another country to an audience for which English is not their first language, this is not a good thing because I can lose people. Um, but I realize that trying to talk like I'm extremely placid just does, it doesn't work for me. So, so, uh, so, so, so trying, to, uh, trying to be yourself, or the, but the best possible version of yourself is something which I think is, is, is worth doing. Uh, and another thing is that in trying to become a better teacher, I, at the beginning, I would try to rebuild myself from the beginning and do 10 or 15 different things. I'd be exhausted. And I realize now that if I try one new thing for each course, and only one new thing for each course. Then first of all, trying one thing is not hard. And it gives me something to do each time. And my mind can only really, I can only hold one thing in my head at a time anyway. And, so, uh, and somehow just doing one new thing, uh, that's what I've tried to do. And that's worked well for me. That every single course, I've got to think of something to, to tweak. Uh, something which came up in a conversation with, uh, when I was asking people earlier this week uh, who, uh, uh, who would be typical audience members here, what, uh, of, of what life was like in their departments. I do think there's this myth, and I really think it's self-serving. And I've heard this 
essentially said word for word in several departments uh, by uh, people talking about colleagues' comments. Uh, great teachers are born or not made. And this is self-serving because you feel, you know, I'm a bad teacher, I can't help it. That's just who I am. Uh, and that just is, it's empirically not true uh, uh, in the sense that I, at this point, maybe many of the older people in this room have seen many people, have seen colleagues become better year after year after year by doing small, by not becoming someone they're not, but by simply paying attention to very small things. We notice it with our graduate students as well. Some are terrible teachers from beginning to end, I think, and some are fantastic teachers from beginning to end. And so, but there's a, 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 there are a reasonable number who actually can and do improve. And it's always wonderful writing a teaching letter for them where I can, well, where I can say that at the beginning, their ratings were really kind of low, and then they actually cared. And then they went, and, and then they, and, and, and often it's a bumpy road. This is, it's an empirical, this is, I'm happy to talk privately afterward and give, without names, lots of examples. But you can make a difference. Uh, and, um, and, uh, uh, and another self-serving myth, which I think is dangerous, because I think a lot of people do believe it as well, is that people don't like me because I don't give high grades. And I, I want to say something I do in my class, especially at Stanford. Um, so I tend to give perhaps lower grades than others. Uh, I, I tend to be harder. But I, I, but I, I think what helps, well, let me, before I say this, I should say, even some departments I fear are making this mistake. That if you're losing students, you think, if we make this a more easy major, then more students will sign up. And this is, and I'm not so sure this is true, especially at a place, uh, uh, certainly at a place like Stanford. So at the beginning of, our, of, of most of my classes, um, what I prefer to do is make clear that, that, uh, that it's going to be a hard class. There are easier versions of the class to take. And if they, want, if, they, uh, if they want to take an easier version, I'll point them to the class. I'll say, take it next quarter, take, take this, this number. Uh, uh, so, but uh, but if, you, if you want to take this class, I will make it worth your while. Uh, and so students add the class, and they do not drop the class after that. So the, Stanford, the kind of students we get are students who want to learn. Uh, and somehow, uh, the, the, we, you do not. If it, you, we do, you do not want to attract the students who want the easy A. You want you want to attract the students, and they are in the majority at Stanford. Uh, they're the majority of the Stanford uh, at, at Stanford um, who actually uh, who actually want to learn. Uh, so so let me uh, let me get to the, discuss how uh, how you can frame things in good ways and bad ways. And again, I'm going to quote phrases that I have heard. Uh, colleagues in different departments say. This one is stronger than they would often say. But I have heard this essentially word for word, uh, that, if, that, if, you, uh, that if, you, if you think the students in your class are not the kinds of students that back when I was in college, uh, 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 they were, they were, we were much more intellectually interested, we knew much more, we would work harder. Uh, and again, I should say, it's, this, there's no question that the students at Stanford are are overwhelmingly bright and interested, they may not want to become a professor in the same narrow subdiscipline as you. But they, and they may all go off and do something fantastic in some different field. But they're there in your class. For, they chose to be in your class. They want to learn something from you. It's going to be valuable for them. And somehow, if you see them in this way, then once again, it's about knowing your audience. If you do not get something across to your audience, it's your fault, not their fault, because you should have known who they were to begin with. And in this case, we have in our classrooms, and this is true not just at Stanford, but here we're especially blessed that we've got these fantastic students. And it's kind of our fault that we screw it up, that, that, we, that, uh, that they are interested. They may not want to become, it doesn't bother me that they don't want to become, uh, al all, they don't all want to become algebraic geometers and do exactly what I do. But it, it kind of is exciting to me that they're going to go off and conquer the world in many different ways. And uh, so another way, and this is something which is not just math specific, but mathematics has this uh, blessing and the curse that uh, we see students in some sense from age three to age 93, from, from uh, retired engineers who come to talks on one end uh, and to young, bright kids. But, uh, and they, they come through and they go off and they do all sorts of different things. We can think about what happens in, say, a calculus class as being really very narrow. There's a small amount of facts we want them to learn, or as part of some extremely large narrative, which is that this is something incredibly important. So if you think about your class as teaching a few things that they have to regurgitate on the test, which again is a, this is a, not an unreasonable thing to think, and, I, and, I've, and the sentiment is one you've, you may have actually heard, but if you think that what's gonna happen in your class is they're gonna, is you're gonna, is they're gonna actually learn how to think in a better way, and part of that involves learning content, it changes how you get the content across. The content 
is important, but it's part of some, it, it, it completely changes where you spend your time um, in class and also out of class and in office hours. Or, um, and this is something which is, the, the danger is probably greatest in mathematics and greatest in pure mathematics, uh, but I think it's also true in, in many departments uh, at, a, at a leading research university, which is, uh, I think many mathematicians do think of their field, in this, our field in this way, which is that we have nothing to say, that in some sense, we've, there's this really amazingly cool stuff that we do, you, you wouldn't understand it, and I, I, I've got really, uh, and, and whatever you're doing is not very interesting either, so I've got nothing to say to you. Uh, and, and, and this applies to our students too. Most of our students, again, are not, uh, are, are, are not exactly like us. But instead, you could say, with exactly the same material, and this is, I think, is an undeniable statement, that the tools we, uh, that we have are radically interdisciplinary. We are, we are either, we're not the least connected field, we are the most connected field. Uh, uh, the tools get used everywhere. Our students are unusually diverse. They're gonna do anything and everything. Uh, and, uh, and thanks to what we teach them, they're going, to, they're going to be amazingly successful. So it's, with, and I should say, I don't mean to be, uh, I don't mean to be self-aggrandizing about mathematics. I think every field should th that can and does think of itself in this central way. What we do here at Stanford, what you're doing is, is, is incredibly interesting and central, and it shouldn't, somehow you can look at it in a narrow way or in a broad way. And if you, if you look at it in a narrow way, you're just not going to reach your students and not be useful for your students. And if you think about things in a broad way, then life here is incredibly rewarding. It's just amazing that we have the students we, we have, um, and they're going to do amazing things. Uh, and then again, the attitude of research versus teaching, this is something I've heard, this I th I'm sure you've heard uh, repeatedly, which is, it's true, this is, it's great being, uh, it's great being in a place like Stanford where we're at the cutting edge of research and we do something which is incredibly important and teaching is a distraction. Uh, and, uh, but with exactly the same situation, you could rethink, of, uh, rethink, uh, how, uh, rethink uh, how you look at things and it's not surprising that if what we do is so important that this should be the place. This of all places on the planet should be the place where people should come and want to learn and who better to learn from than people like us. So, uh, so it's, uh, so, so, I, so I think starting with the starting with the starting in the same place, you you could have very different takes on uh, uh, on how you approach a class. Uh, and when you do approach a class, uh, how you frame things changes how you actually approach something. So, for when when giving a giving a course, uh, again, this is going to be in the this counts as obvious. But if you look at the courses in the course catalog, it's clear it's not so obvious. Which is that. Every course is a story. Every lecture is a story. Every course is a story, and there should be some story arc. And I, and uh, I would say that the the courses that should have the hardest time producing a story arc are things like uh, the calculus classes of mathematics, where there's sort of something, uh, there's a certain body of material to be known to, to to be learned. And yet even there, there's a solid story arc you could tell. So if there is no story arc, if there's no punchline, uh, if there's no punchline to the course, if there's uh, it, so, if the course you're teaching isn't something that you think isn't going to change someone's life, uh, uh, change the course of their life, then I don't know why you're teaching that class. That, that there's, there's, there's really no point. Uh, you, we have, uh, and if you can do this with multivariable calculus, uh, then I, 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 if you're going to complain you can't do it with your class, I'm, I'm not very sympathetic. Uh, the, uh, that, you, that, you can that you can teach something if you really believe it's important. And I hope you believe your subject is important. And if you don't believe your subject is important, you should go find another job. Uh, 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 that, that if what you do is important, then you should be able to get this across. And uh, this course happens in smaller scales too, that uh, every class should ideally have a, a punchline. And in terms of intentionality, I want to mention two things which are perhaps more science-based, science, uh, uh, science which is, and problem sets in particular are, are very much mathematics-based in the sense that this is how gifted students learn mathematics when they're from 10 years old on, which is what problem sets are for. And so we give problem sets out not because we're supposed to. We give problem sets out because they, they should serve some sort of learning purpose. And at least in parts of the sciences, much of the learning happens from problem solving. You learn not because someone tells you some fact. The facts are tools, they're raw materials. The actual learning happens on the problem set. So, the, so, uh, so when you create a problem set, you should, you should know very well what each problem is supposed to, to build in a not very directed way. But what, what type of thinking uh, are they meant to solidify? Similarly for exams, 
Um, I, I, so exams, of course, have, have two purposes. One is assessment, self-assessment and assessment for grades. And the other is, is a learning experience. I want to point out where the learning happens on exams is not in that one to three hours. That's too small a time. The learning happens in the study for the exam. Uh, and, uh, and where the students spend much more hours, many more hours preparing. And so what you want to do, I don't really care what learning to happen on, I mean, the assessment matters, but it doesn't matter too much. What really matters is what they're doing while they're studying for the exam. So I often give out a practice exam, and I also, you should know that your exams are going to be kept for future generations. So the people who are going to learn from your exam are not the current students. They're the future students who will look at those, at, who will look at the problems and spend much longer thinking about them. So I give out practice exams and actual exams, and I secretly know that the practice exams are the ones where the learning happens, because that's the ones that the students are going to spend lots of time working through. Okay, so, uh, so, so that's, uh, so, that, so a, lot of the, a lot of these things I'm saying are, are fairly standard and common, but I want to say a little bit about where my thinking about this comes from, which is quite specific. Uh, uh, quite culturally specific. Uh, it's, fr it's from these, these, so mathematics people are often caught by the subject at quite a young age. Uh, certainly most of my colleagues were caught and recognized long before college, probably I'd say 15 or, or, or earlier is when you're somehow brought into the pipeline. And many other people are brought in the pipeline and then go off to do interesting things. And there's a particular institution that was active in Eastern Europe uh, from, I'm not even sure, from uh, at least the better part of a century, maybe much longer, in which students from age roughly 10 or up um, uh, get involved in these things called math circles. Where they, and the way in which they learn, uh, first of all, I should say that empirically it's clear this is successful in some sense, that a huge number of leaders in, in my field and many nearby fields were, went to these, uh, happened to be brought into these things. And it's something where, in the US, there's this habit of taking kids, if you're right, and just accelerating them, have them learn more and more content, thinking that that has value. Whereas in Eastern Europe, it was really about learning how to think. Uh, 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 through solving interesting problems. And so, and the other aspect of it is in, in, in the US and in the West, there's a segmentation of learning where we have young students talk to primary teachers. And, and the primary teachers don't talk to elementary teachers, don't talk to high school teachers, don't talk to uh, undergraduates, don't talk to graduate students, don't talk to faculty, don't talk to uh, uh, researchers. In Eastern Europe, the, the, there's this there was, I mean, I, I'm not, I'm not going to argue that we should move to a, a totalitarian communist system. But, there, uh, but, but this one aspect is something which is being imported into the US uh, quite successfully as Eastern Europeans have moved here, which is that the, the kids work with high school students and college students and, uh, and the whole spectrum. And you'll have kids who are 10 years old hearing from 70-year-old from faculty members who come in to talk to them. Uh, and there is a continuum where there are different events for different people, different age groups. Uh, and the way in which learning happens is not curricular. Uh, there, uh, a ancient professor who's, who's 70 year, years old passes on interesting puzzle to 15 year old student uh, who, who then discusses it with 35 year old young faculty member uh, and so forth. And so the key thing is that students are learning material on their own for fun. They, they get absolutely nothing out of it. They work collaboratively, but in a non-directed way. And the social aspect is, a, is essential. And I should say the reason which, why I am a mathematician today other than perhaps for me maybe an economist or a physicist, is sort of somewhat accidental in the sense that when I was at a certain age, I was in a school, um, I, I had great people in my school, but there wasn't, it wasn't one of these super schools, but I happened to be caught by something where I had a chance to meet bright people from around the country, who then I had a chance to meet people from around the world, they became my friends, I learned, I, 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 this was the dawn of email, so we could, we could exchange things. The social aspect of learning and building these social communities is, 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 is absolutely essential. And what I would like to do is bring this to undergraduate education, uh, to, to, in, uh, to, to, to change the way in which people learn mathematics or just learn in general as undergraduates. And one experiment, one experiment uh, which I tried, which I'd like to at least share some features of, because I think some of them are applicable elsewhere, is a problem solving seminar which is named after Polya, who is a professor here, uh, uh, who in turn was, was uh, importing some ideas from, uh, from, uh, from Europe. Uh, and so, so, here's, so here was the experiment. And it, was, uh, uh, and it worked better than I thought. But as with all experiments, not everything works really well. So, so we had something for three hours per week, roughly three hours a week in the fall quarter around dinner, usually Monday or Tuesday. Tuesday. 
Uh, and so basically what people do is they would come and they would do problems together and present at the board. So part of it was figuring stuff out. It was doing it in a group. Um, and the people who were taking part ranged from high school students. It was four undergraduates. High school students would come. Uh, graduate students would come. Young faculty would come and be stuck on problems together. Uh, and it would be, there'd be things without a roadmap. There'd be no, there'd be no actual curriculum. People would learn things. But the key thing, and at the end of it, it was related to a competition which people could take if they wanted to, but they didn't have to. They didn't have to go to the seminar to take the competition. They didn't have to do the competition if they came to the seminar. And, and this competition is often called the hardest test in the world because uh, for, for, it's six hours. It's the Saturday before final exams at Stanford. Uh, the, the, uh, roughly 4,000 of the self-selected best and brightest and the uh, mathematically best and brightest in the, state, in the U.S. and Canada take it, and the median score is zero out of 120. Uh, so why would you do such a thing? Uh, uh, and, and so the students were doing this. They got no credit. They got pizza, but they're having dinner anyway. I think pizza is the least of what they got. So, so they got absolutely nothing for it. Most of the students, were getting a single point out of 120 would be a big deal. You don't get a big prize. Um, uh, and yet we had about 150 students taking part. Uh, we, uh, we, had, uh, we, uh, we had, the uh, I think, a five or six-fold increase in number of math majors over those years. So why were they doing this? And I've got to say, the reason, uh, the, I was, uh, what was incredibly impressive were watching the people who were, there, and again, most of these are not going to become mathematicians. You had people who were in a wide variety of fields who were just interested in stretching themselves and pushing themselves. And the people who I believe are going to be taking over the world are, are not, uh, of course, the ones who are the best two or three at Stanford of those 150 are going to go off and be fantastic mathematicians. But, the, but they're actually another, and I know their names. I had, I, had, uh, I had lunch with a couple of them who started a hedge fund really last week. Uh, they're, they're, they're going to, the ones who really impress me are the, are the people who are fighting to get one and may get zero. The ones who are, who are, who are going to take, who are going to be busy with final exams and are going, to, uh, are going to spend a huge amount of time on this for nothing more than their own than their own amusement and edification. So, they, so they, I believe they think better. They're, they certainly were stronger uh, mathematically, uh, but socially it mattered too because for the first time, students then could, if they're wondering what course they should take next year, they would know someone who's two years ahead of them. It wasn't the segmentation by year where the freshmen or the freshmen, the sophomores or the sophomores, and so forth. The, the, the freshmen would be sitting beside the assistant professor stuck on the same problem and could ask for advice. So about building these things across years um, make a big difference. And in particular, once again, we consider giving course credit for it. I think now we do offer some very small amount of credit. But the danger, I think it really is true, that as soon as you offer course credit for it, people will, will become less interested. If you make it a challenge and make it interesting, people, these people, our people, uh, and they are our people, uh, um, will come. So I think that they were, so, so they were, uh, so, so, so I, I find that impressive. And these are the kinds of students we want, and these are the kinds of students we have. And I should say, once we started doing this, we started recruiting a different kind of student. People who would not have applied to Stanford in the past started applying. And the ones who applied, the ones who wouldn't come in the past, wouldn't accept offers, started to come too. And again, I, 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 there's not, I can't do, I have not tried to do an explicit study, but I should say the actual numbers of students, how we've done in, in various, by various measures, it's undeniable that the last decade there's been a huge impact. And it's all extracurricular, that somehow the learning happens outside and all you do is really set it up. And the fact that we have fantastic courses is, is related. They would only come if, the, if, 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 if they can work within the structure of, these fantastic, uh, of our fantastic university. OK, so I'd like to, uh, so in the last part before I get to, a, uh, before I, I, I get to a, the more, uh, before the off the record part, um, let me, uh, I, I could talk a little bit about uh, using clicker type experiments in more advanced undergraduate courses, but I think for the, uh, give the, given that it's around 20, 20 of, um, I, I'd like to talk about some aspects of the, uh, of, of the course uh, that I was, in, I was fortunate to be involved with this fall, uh, which is part of this education and self-fashioning experiment, uh, uh, in which six faculty members uh, in, uh, gave five, either five courses or five incarnations of the same course, which, which had it satisfied their writing requirement, their thinking matters requirement, uh, there, there, were, there were aspects, there were many aspects in common, they had a common theme, and yet they were all disciplinarily based. Um, and I'd like to explain something about the course rather than giving many details. Um, and before I do, let me say that 
that, that there's, a, there's a, a question maybe for especially younger colleagues who are maybe arriving at Stanford or maybe watching this on the web years from now as they're deciding whether to come to Stanford. Uh, why should, uh, an important question is why should, why might someone do something like this? I think faculty often have an incentive to teach the same class year after year because you can somehow do it without thinking and not be, and, and it can use as little of your time as possible. So what's in it for you? Why, why should you consider doing a strange course like this that's, that's high risk, uh, where there's no guarantee of success? You don't even know how it's going to turn out. You're not quite sure what your students are. Uh, and so maybe the first question is, uh, is it, and I have been asked this explicitly by various colleagues who've considered doing this, is it a lot of work? And let me say, first of all, that it, it was more, not much more, but more work than a typical course. But let me say that the question is the wrong one. And that the goal when you're doing something like this is, is not to, I mean, ideally, we're, you know, we should, uh, we're all marvelous teachers and we're gonna spend 100 hours a week uh, uh, generating fantastic new courses. And, and the answer is, or my answer is, you, if, if that's what you had to do, no one would do such a course. You should frankly teach for your, do it for your own entertainment. Uh, if there's something interesting you want to do, it should be fun for you. If it's not, mainly because if it's not fun for you, you're not going to do it. Uh, and maybe a secret is that if it is fun for you, your students are going to have fun. Uh, uh, so, so, so somehow set your goals low. <laughs> in some, uh, don't, try to, don't try to change the world, just try to entertain yourself. And that's the best way to experiment. Uh, so that was, my, that was my attitude and it ended up being far better than I, uh, well, as, as, as good as I hoped and, and better than I expected. Um, and part of it, a benefit I did not realize I would have until, until the course was over, was that I felt as though I was taking a risk. And the SUS, in the SUS committee, we often talked about, there are many things we talked about that were kind of interesting about the culture of the university. And we were often, as faculty, bothered by the culture of the students. And one thing which, bothered, which I noticed maybe more than anyone else, because it bothered me more than anyone else, is that everything you said about the students, really if you said it about the faculty, it would apply equally well. Uh, uh, and, uh, but, but of course, we were faculty, we were going to discuss, we, we were going to fix the students. And the, and, the, and the culture of the university is shaped by the faculty. It's shaped by the people who are teaching the, uh, who are teaching the classes. And of course, I should say by faculty, I include including the graduate students who are working with the undergraduates. Uh, everyone who, uh, the faculty for me is everyone who's, 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 who's teaching, uh, uh, who are teaching the students. So it's a faculty culture, which uh, is our culture, which affects, uh, drives the student culture. Um, and we, one, we did notice our undergraduates are trained not to take risks, to do things that are very safe. We, as, we are also trained not to take risks. And I had this sense of sort of jumping out of a plane without a parachute, uh, which was actually quite pleasant along, until you hit the ground, uh, the, uh, the, uh, uh, the, uh, 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 of being willing to fail. Uh, and so, so, so that was, I'm not sure I would necessarily sell this as something you should try to do, but. Um, but it can actually be fun and worthwhile. In particular, I met some really fantastic students. Uh, and the other thing I noticed which surprised me or I didn't expect is that when I, is this course, the nature of this course, and in particular my incarnation of the course, was baffling to, to, to faculty. And it was not baffling to, my stu to the students in the class. They, the, they would understand but some, because they were, they were not yet siphoned into these narrow disciplines where it was unclear, uh, where, where it was, uh, where to be interested in something different outside of one narrow discipline is, uh, is seen to be a bad thing. So, uh, so what I wanted to do is to at least say, spend a few minutes trying to tell you the case I was trying to make for the students, because I think this is a case about what Stanford, uh, this is a case, one possible vision of what Stanford is. And it's not the universal vision of what Stanford is, but by saying this, I'm trying to make a case for what we should be, what we should be as a university. Um, uh, so, uh, so at the beginning, I'll say this was a liberal arts course, but it was a hardcore mathematics proof course. It was a hardcore mathematics proof course, but it was a writing course. And these things are not in, con are not in conflict uh, and should not be in conflict, and historically were not in conflict. Uh, so, so what I wanted to do is have the students think actively, intentionally about their education, not, uh, not, not act by inertia, to think about who they're becoming. And I see this point of view as being particularly American, uh, uh, or at least North American, uh, and associated with the American educational system. And the idea of reinvention is a particularly American thing. And the idea that, that the students are coming here to invent themselves and reinvent themselves as, uh, uh, as something which is not, uh, colleges are not, universities are not seen that way in most of the rest of the world. 
so the premise of the course is the following thing. To me, this is the premise for how I, uh, how I approach essentially all my classes, which is that uh, different disciplines change the way you think. And I mean this in the following way. Uh, so friends who became economists, uh, who I knew before and after, when you, if you know economists, they tend to think in a different way. If you knew them before, you realize education really does change how you approach problems and think about, and think about the world. It's also true for uh, friends who went to law school. Uh, and it's also true for mathematicians and computer scientists. Mathematicians and computer scientists, uh, I think, really uh, think in a noticeably different way at the end of, at the end of four years. And there's no class. That, we don't teach a class in critical thinking. We don't have a major in critical thinking. That would be, that would be stupid. Uh, you learn critical thinking in the course of, of, of learning, some, uh, learning some or many disciplines. Uh, and so once you, once you realize that, you, that what you learn changes the way in which you think, then you can intentionally change the way in which you think. And when you're beginning college, you can plan your undergraduate education by deciding that you want to learn to think in a better way. And this will require you to, to, to deliberately seek out ways to stretch your mind in different ways. So, uh, so, so in this particular version of the class, we investigated the, what, what I might call the formal sciences, the mathematical sci mathematics the kind of thing that's common in mathematics, computer science, certain parts of statistics. And you don't do this by doing philosophy and mathematics. You don't do this by doing history and mathematics. That's sort of backwards. You, uh, you learn by doing, not by watching. So, so you understand this way of thinking by doing mathematics. And, uh, and conversely, just as you're forced to think mathematically when you try to understand the world, uh, then you're forced to think about philosophical questions and historical questions and empirical scientific questions when you start to think mathematically. So the disciplines are really much more connected and not so cut up. And I wanted them to see why different sorts of questions are interesting. You realize that when you come to college, and it shouldn't end at college, that, uh, that, that your education is about ideas, and, uh, is, and ideas leak across boundaries, uh, and, and that they should be interested in things not because I told them so or because their major requires some courses, but because we're led to them by, by, by considering the world. And I don't see this as a, math, a disciplinarily narrow case. And, uh, so, so, in, so, so in, in, in particular, the, the course is about the liberal arts, and I now want to say some things that are uh, that, that stretch beyond mathematics. The meaning of the phrase "liberal arts" is deliberately vague. At Stanford, we agree we're a liberal arts university, but don't ask anyone to pin down what they mean by the liberal arts, or people will get into a bit of a fight. And and uh, and I think about this, so I'm Canadian, uh, and uh, and. Uh, when I was younger, Canada went through the stage where we, unlike the U.S., we decided to, uh, we, we, which already had a constitution, we decided to create one. And then we had to decide what the country was all about. And before we had to sit down and write something, everyone agreed what Canadian values were. But when we actually had to put something in writing, then we realized how much we might disagree. And the same is true, very much true about the U.S. If the country had to come together and rewrite the constitution, it could, just could not work. But the fact that we can now say things quietly and not try to uh, just talk about motherhood and apple pie and not try to pin things down, uh, th there's an advantage to not getting too uh, uh, to, uh, to getting uh, to not getting too precise. But I wanted to be clear with our under our students, and I think it's worth as 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 as, uh, as, uh, as uh, people who are formerly students to be open about the fact that there's a lot of con controversy controversy and it's and it's collegial. But we should fight it. We should argue about it. And in, in a strong sense. We should see this, this is a struggle for the souls of our students, because it's a struggle for who they're going to become and how they're going to think about the world. And this is really, you know, th this is a, a key part of, of the struggle for the future of mankind. Yeah, because th our students, uh, and I, I don't mean that, that sounds grandiose, but it really is true. We are, we are potentially the leading university in the world. How we teach our students to think about the world is going to drive the future of, um, of, of our species. And in particular, there are those at this university who would narrow our students uh, and who would tell them that understanding something deeply requires them to lose, uh, to, to lose interest in and appreciation for other, other kinds of thinking. So I wanted to bring this argument in the open uh, and, uh, and have them disagree with us and disagree with each other. And, and so in particular, I'd like to make the claim, and, and this affects how we should teach our classes, that Stanford, I have nothing, no more slides, but I'll keep the website up. That Stanford is a new kind of university, and it affects how we should teach our classes in ways that are actually different than other universities teach, uh, teach our classes. So, uh, uh, so, so first, I want to explain why I think our model of a university is different than any, any other university in the world, uh, for, 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 for rather good reasons. Uh, so first of all, I said, as I said before, 
I think there's a case that the best place for the best students to get the best education is at a research university. And that's not an obvious case. I think that's what's one that, that we should, that if we don't believe in, I don't know why we have a college. Uh, uh, if we do believe in it, we have to put our money where our mouth is and, and, and really make the case that the best students should come here and provide them with the best possible education. Uh, I, and, uh, and secondly, so, 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 what, so that applies to many of the top research universities on the planet. But now let me say something where things start to get different. So if you were to compare Stanford with any other university uh, uh, in all fields, so uh, uh, as, a, as an example, uh, if you look at the, uh, often when, when recruiting undergraduates to convince them to come here to learn here, I tell them to look at the graduate rankings. Uh, and you look across all fields, and admittedly you take that with a grain of salt, but there's some information in there. You compare Stanford head to head with any other university, Stanford beats every other university hands down. And many would say that's unfair because our peers, uh, some don't have engineering, others are weak at the humanities, others are, but, uh, but that's exactly my point. That st at Stanford, we are good. We are, it's part of the goal of the university to, to be good at everything. And it matters that the med school is, uh, even, uh, it matters even to a pure mathematician that the med school is, is, is not across the river, but it's, it's right here. The business school is very near, is right there. The law school is right here. The ed school is right here. Uh, the, uh, everything is connected. And it doesn't mean that every single faculty member, every single student should be an expert at every single thing. Uh, that, uh, that once again, the best place for the best students to learn will be from experts in, uh, in, in particular fields. Uh, and, so, uh, and so this comes down, uh, so this affects how we, should, uh, how we should teach. And again, I should say that some would say that this is the fact that, that we have professional schools on campus, that our students will go off and do professional things with their lives, uh, is antithetical to the notion of a liberal arts education. Uh, and, uh, uh, and so we've had this discussion in my department, and I know other departments have had discussions like this as well, that the fact that our students are not going to become like ourselves is seen as, uh, as something, uh, something dangerous. But I want to say that there's, it's, I think it's no coincidence that Silicon Valley grew here in the intellectually fertile soil here, not near Caltech or Carnegie Mellon or MIT. So, uh, so I don't mean to say something idiotic that, that, that people who want to change the world in this particular way uh, uh, and want to start a company must have a degree in the humanities. But I think it matters. I think Stanford's case is that, is that you're best served by being in a place where the best minds in all fields are collected. Uh, and it matters even if you're a researcher in some narrow field that when you teach your classes, that the people in your classes are, are, smart, uh, are, are smart and interested across the board, and you have to actually, uh, you have to actually teach to them. Uh, uh, so in particular, I guess the case I, I make to prospective undergraduates, and then the case I feel is that we have to make to our undergraduates once they're here, is that if you want to be surrounded by bright people very like yourselves, all thinking in the same way, uh, then you should not come to Stanford. And I would even say that for faculty members too, graduate students, even if you're going to specialize, if you want to be really narrow, this is not the place for you. Uh, and you sh really should go somewhere else. But if you, but if you want to be, some, if, but if you, if, if you do want to be surrounded by very bright people who think very differently than you, uh, who are going to go off to change the world in radically different ways, then this should be the best place in the world. And this affects how we should teach our calculus classes, our computer science classes, our history classes, our English classes. Uh, I, and, uh, and it means that we should teach these classes in ways that are different than we perhaps taught them two or three decades ago when, when, when the world was a, was a narrower and smaller place. And in particular, uh, a lack of curiosity is a, is, is a fundamental sin against, uh, against our humanity, and it's, sort of, it's, it's opposed to what Stanford's about. So when you structure your courses, uh, I want to bring this back to, uh, to, to somewhat more concrete things, when you structure your courses, uh, it's a good thing that our students are extreme. They're, they're extremely smart, but they're extremely varied. And you have to be, uh, uh, and the courses have to be structured in such a way. OK, so, so on that, I think I should probably end the public portion. Uh, I, I, so, so I was wondering, maybe I should, should we have some questions before turning off the camera, or, uh, or should I wait until afterwards? Is that a? OK, great. Great, OK, thanks. Can we turn off the camera? I will turn